Hello and thank you for joining the Tuesday edition of Journalist Hangout. I'm Ayodili Uzubahun. Today on the program, we focus on Nigeria's leadership culture challenge with the senior pastor of Dista Christian Center, Pastor Sam Adeyemi, as our guests. I'll be hanging out with Babajide Koladi Utitoju and Asuko James. So if you're ready, let the hangout start now. We are passionate about two things in Nigeria. The first is football. The second is our rice. And nobody celebrates like a Nigerian. So, for every goal scored, every mark made, you can be sure to always come back home to rice. Celebrate with Nigerian Premium Big Bull Rice, homegrown just like you. Big Bull Rice, tasty rice, nourished you. We are passionate about two things in Nigeria. The first is football. The second is our rice. And nobody celebrates like a Nigerian. So, for every goal scored, every mark made, you can be sure to always come back home to rice. Celebrate with Nigerian Premium Big Bull Rice, homegrown just like you. Big Bull Rice, tasty rice, nourished you. In today's world, our lifestyle, both at work and at play, depends on connectivity. Our connectivity depends on the devices that make it possible, and these devices depend on electric power. When power fails, our life shrinks, our work drops, and our joy dips. JRB Solar Energy Systems are here to ensure that we enjoy uninterruptible power, uninterruptible joy. Whether you're running a business, an institution, or just a home, you return daily to rest. JRB has got you covered. No project is too big for our super digital inverters, long-lasting batteries, and efficient solar panels. Go. Dream on. Change your world. JRB Solar Inverters, Batteries, Solar Panels, Solar Street lights and more. Telephone 0906 752 Email sales at jrbsolar.com. With JRB, the sun's gonna shine on everything you do. Thank you for staying with us. Now to our special interview on the program with one of Nigeria's most charismatic and practical pastors, Pastor Sam Adeyemi. He is the founder and the senior pastor of Daystar Christian Center, Nigeria, one of the largest and fastest growing churches in Africa. Pastor Adeyemi founded the church in 1995 with only few people, but has grown they start to become one of the largest growing churches in Africa with more than 20,000 members in Lagos. He's a leading voice in preaching the principles of maximizing potentials and promoting visionary leadership through television and radio broadcasts, publications, seminars, and books across the globe. Thank you for staying with us. And we have joining us live via Zoom is Pastor Sam Adeyemi. Thank you for joining us, sir. Thank you very much for having me on Journalists Hangout today. <laughs> okay, let's start with the idea of Daystar. How did you come about it, and how did pastoral work become a lifetime thing for you? Thank you very much. I was a branch pastor of uh, Rema Chapel International Churches in Lagos. And, you know, I had some disappointments early part of 1994. And those disappointments, you know, some disappointments kind of want to tell you that you're not going forward. And I then told my wife, we need to fast and pray. So I remember the Monday after Easter, 1994, that we went together to Lekki Beach and we were fasting and praying I felt the impression to continue the prayer and fasting. And it was July, one morning in July, that I got a download of inspiration. And it was to 
uh, to go on the media, interestingly, because my primary gifting is teaching. I love knowledge, but I love to distill it, arrange it, I recognize patterns, but I love to arrange it in a way that I can give it to people in a simple way that they can apply to their lives. And the inspiration I got was to go mega with it, to go on radio, TV, you know, to do seminars and conferences and so on. And instantly I saw quite all right that I would not be able to do that as a branch pastor. And I saw that we would also need to set up a church. So I took action on both and we founded both in 1995. TVC News, wherever the big news story is happening, we're geared up to break it. TVC News, first with breaking news. At TVC News, wherever the big news story is happening, we're geared up to break it. TVC News, first with breaking news. as the best TV station of the year. TVC News breaks into the core of every event as they happen. Following all nationwide big and impactful stories. Without the news from every perspective. Covering every human angle. I am Veronica, bringing you the news you would want to watch. Politics is defined as getting what, where, when and how but in the mix many things come to play to shape the political fortune of any country Honourable Minister, the public. from the political actors to the electorate campaign to voting from debates to policy decisions big events happen to engage us in constant conversation that's what we're looking for not some people who are talking about ethnicity no who is on your mind don't worry Join me every day on Politics Tonight, where we dissect issues that shape our political destiny. Politics Tonight, weekdays on TVC News. Doubt and fear doesn't occur at the canvas. Thank you for staying with us. We still have the senior pastor of this time, Christian Center, Pastor Sam Adeyemi, with us. And let's talk about the new generation church ownership in Nigeria. Who was the church, Pastor Adeyemi? Wow. That is an interesting question. But I'll say this. It, that is decided actually by the law. So the law that governs the operation of non-profit organizations in Nigeria says nobody can own a non-profit. It is collectively founded by some people they choose some people to represent them before the law. When you register with the Corporate Affairs Commission, they are listed as trustees. So let's say the church has a legal issue to resolve in the law court. It is the trustees that go to court to represent the church. They're the ones that can be sued on behalf of the church. So, so the law actually does not provide for a church being owned. <laughs> by the pastor. It's not a business at all. It is collectively founded by members and they are represented by a board of trustees. Why do we have church leadership gets inherited by the wife or children of the founder after the deaths? Is there a succession plan in place, like in your church now, this time? Well, what I would say is that uh, we need to appreciate that we're talking about new generation churches. The older churches, I mean, were founded mostly by Europeans or Americans, if, if, if you look at them closely. So you're dealing with a cultural issue. The, the parts of the world where these organizations, the older churches came from, are democratic. 
you know, in their leadership styles. In our own part of the world, uh, until the, the until we got independence, you know, it was the monarchy. So, and in the monarchy, you know, it's hierarchical like that. It's family. So we're still evolving. That's what I would say. We're still evolving. So we cannot say that there is actually a consistent uh, practice across all the churches now because the churches are actually young. Most new generation churches are being led right now by their founders. Mm. So we're dealing with, a, a, with an evolving situation. And so maybe, let's say 10, 20, 30 years, then you will see a lot of succession happening. What we can do right now is to, to propose, right? <laughs> you know, do some hypothesis and advice on the best thing to do. Now, when you talk about uh, uh, spouses and children taking over from founders, um, there are many factors, you know, that influence that. Um, but generally, we've had court cases over succession issues. So it's still an evolving scenario. Some churches don't have a succession plan. Um, we have something from the get-go when, when they start registered with the Corporate Affairs Commission. We put something in there. Now, that was over 20 years ago. So right now, we're reviewing. And, you know, I did my doctoral program in leadership. My master's dissertation was on succession planning. So as it is now, we've come to realize that succession is not only about the change of the number one person. Where succession is done properly, succession is meant to be done at all levels. That is what makes the CEO succession easier. So in this style, what we've done is to create a succession framework that you know, guides how we plan succession at all levels. We've identified all the critical roles you know, in the church and want to be sure there is at least one person or there are two people part time you know, that are ready to take over anybody's critical role. And those critical roles include that of the senior pastor. Okay, why do new generation pastors focus more on prosperity preaching than salvation of soul or eternity? Mm. Okay, <laughs> again, um, that's a general statement, again, um, and it is difficult to just characterize generally. But I'll tell you again that when you look at our history, the new generation churches mostly started in the 70s, picked up steam in the 80s, and then exploded in the 90s. And sadly, this was also a period of time when the economy degenerated, you know, gradually degenerated in the country. So ministry was tailored to meet the needs in the, in, in the society. Uh, if, we, if we're accused of preaching prosperity, for example, uh, there are different colorations to it, different colorations. Okay, yeah, maybe there are those that have been teaching, oh, if you give 1,000 naira, God will make you a millionaire, right? <laughs> but then also there were those of us who were teaching entrepreneurship. Okay? I was running a class, entrepreneurial class, some 21, 22 years ago in Desta, you know, on Sunday morning. There was practically nowhere else to get the information. The only place you could go was Lagos Business School. How many people could afford to go to Lagos Business School? We, when we did a survey, right, of the needs of people in the community, poverty came number one. And then we asked ourselves, so have we been addressing the poverty issue? We looked at the preaching and all that. We said, we can't be asking people to give when they don't have the money. Is there anything in the Bible we can teach them that will help them to get the money? And then we were amazed at how much the Bible has to say about entrepreneurship. The founders of the faith themselves were entrepreneurs from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob to Jesus Christ himself, right? So we we're teaching entrepreneurship, okay, focused on adding value to the people, not taking from the people. If the people prosper, they will give to the church. So I would say need right now. Okay, look at the economy in Nigeria, right? You ask yourself, what are people's major problems? The economic one 
it looks like that's the one that even causes other problems, including health problems, right? But can we say that people are not preaching salvation? I can't say so. I've, when you look at the data, millions of people have given their lives to Christ over the last, last 30, 40 years in Nigeria, millions of them. Has that translated into change in the society? Well, that then is another subject for discussion. <laughs> Uh, Pastor, a few years back, you took a position against Titan. Uh, your position at that time was that some preachers uh, had tied their self-worth to their net worth. Hence, they manipulate the scripture to get people to keep Titan. Do you still believe um, that Titan is not required uh, and that uh, non titans are not on any course. Thank you. Okay, so there was coming up this controversy about Titan, right? And I did what every Christian and preacher should do. Go back into the Bible and research, find out. I did my research and I have a theology teacher. So I sent my findings to the theology teacher. And the theology teacher said, go ahead, I think you're okay. And then my focus was on our church members. I did not want them to be confused about the issue. The church has a way of resolving doctrinal issues. It, it, right from Acts of the Apostles, they started. In Acts 15, you will see this massive debate, you know, amongst the apostles on circumcision. But eventually they came to a resolution. And what was the deciding factor? There is the old covenant, there is the new covenant in the Bible. Yeah. Jesus Christ died. After he died, everything changed. Okay? Everything changed. The requirements changed. What it took to be close to God, to receive forgiveness of sins, and everything changed. So that change is what we then now apply to every scenario. That's the one we're applying to the Titan issue. So the amazing thing about Titan is that it predicted the law in the Bible. It came long before the laws of Moses came. Mm. So you would say that people have always known, you know, for a long time at an intuitive level that you are meant to give back part of what you take. Abraham gave tithes, 10%, right? There are people who have prospered phenomenally in business just going by that principle. But what we found out was after Christ died and resurrected, you only had few references to tithes in the New Testament, and especially in the epistles. No. And they were historical references. There was no instruction for anybody to pay. What we then did also was to look at the practice of giving. We then now found out that, in fact, after the resurrection of Christ, people gave a whole lot more than even the 10%. So we said, let's stay with the principle. Giving is a valid principle. You can't afford to be a stingy person. You need to be generous. You need to give. You need to support the work of God. But then we can't apply uh, the, what you have under the law to pay tight. You have to carry it to a particular location. Interestingly, some of the provisions there in Deuteronomy actually says you should even eat it right there. You know, some kind of tight you paid once in three years and all that. We said, look, you can get away with all that. And then the uh, statement in Mark 3, 8, you have robbed God, uh, you are under a curse, said Galatians says Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. He's, he has absorbed the punishment. So we can't say somebody will be punished now because they're not paying tithes. So it was just those simple uh, things we found from scriptures. I would just say it's an ongoing discussion. Okay, I, I, I get you uh, clearly, but I still want um, greater clarity from you, uh, Pastor. Right. There's a debate that paying tithes as commanded in the Old Testament, I think precisely the book of Deuteronomy is on farm produce and livestock, not right. cash. Some have argued that, oh, it was because there was no money at that time, but we have evidence that 
there was money uh, in, uh, in the biblical era, which now the modern churches would prefer to take money rather than farm produce, as was the case back then. What right. should we do? What should we do? Should we... Uh, let me just say, is it right to take cash as against farm produce that was the norm at that time? That is, if we are even to agree that, okay, tightening should go on. Okay. So tightening is about the giving of value. That's what we should look at. Money is a means of exchange of value. And you were talking about largely agrarian um, economists. So that's why the tide was tied around their farm produce, right? Um, so today, <laughs> what should we say to the person selling engine oil, right? Take 10% of the engine oil in your shop and take it to the church or what? So uh, those things complicate the discussion. There is also in Deuteronomy one of those instances where it, people were instructed that if they could not, if it was too cumbersome to carry the farm produce to the location where they were going, that they should convert the farm produce to money. That provision is also there. So uh, I think it's the principle that really matters. And that's what I was saying, that the principle is about giving to God, about acknowledging God as your source. Now that principle has to be there. In the... Under the old covenant, it was people obeyed God out of fear. Under the new covenant, you obey God out of love. They asked Christ, which is the greatest commandment? He said, love your God, love your neighbor as yourself. So while people were trying to obey God out of fear under the old covenant, Christ said, look, what God was trying to point to was love. And in the new covenant, we now have that love as our nature because we have the nature of God. So that's why I said when you actually look at it under the new covenant, you'll find out people who actually did more giving, right? In Acts of the Apostles, you saw people giving lands. You saw people giving houses. So the basic principle is it's about value and the fact that you should honor God when it comes to material wealth. Don't be greedy. Don't be stingy. Don't be covetous. You know, be generous towards God and towards other people. At the time you took that position on Titan, um, how much criticism uh, came from your colleagues? I, I, I guess a lot of them must have uh, been taken aback. Uh, that you went against the green. How much pressure came upon you at that time from your colleagues uh, in Christendom? <laughs> well, I would say if there was pressure, I didn't hear much of it. I got a few comments, of course, from people that wanted to know more, just like you're asking me. So there were people close enough to ask Oh, how did you come about this position? And I was able to explain uh, that whether it made people uncomfortable. Well, obviously, there was a possibility because it was um, a courageous thing for me to come out and say what I saw about it. But I, I'm also conscious of the fact that I am leading tens of thousands of people. Every week, tens of thousands of people listen to me. And... I have chosen to be authentic, to be honest. I believe that hypocrisy erodes the credibility of a leader, and there's no need being hypocritical. I saw, like I said in the Bible, that people, they debated doctrinal issues and came up with their positions, and I thought, oh, it was good specifically for our church members that <laughs> with this age of social media where they're reading everything every day, I wanted to take a clear biblical position. And they know we have a culture in Desta. They don't swallow everything I say, uh, fisherman, <laughs> hook, line, and sinker, and the ground is standing up. They investigate themselves. So I was making a proposal for them to investigate. But generally, if there were people around town that were not happy, well, 
I didn't hear much of that. Okay. Uh, now let's talk about um, leadership. Uh, the church you pastor uh, has a strong position on leadership. Uh, it has leadership training at all levels, including the Daystar Leadership Academy. Why have you as a person taken leadership so seriously? Mm, thank you. That's, that's an interesting question. I would say I have felt the impact of leadership on my life, right? Um, where the head goes, that's where the rest of the body goes. Moses in the Bible said in Deuteronomy 28, 13, and the Lord will make you the head and not the tail. And I realized he was drawing on the illustration of a cow. And everybody understood what he was saying. If God will make you the head, decision-making is made in the head, where the, the eyes are in the head, <laughs> right? The mouth is in the head. The brain is in the head, the thinking capacity. So that's where decision-making is made. And wherever the head goes, the rest of the body goes. The tail, there is no brain, no thinking that goes on in the tail. They, wherever they drag it, that's where it goes. So leadership is very important. Where leadership goes, that's where everybody else goes first. Secondly, um, when I started teaching success, it was born out of my personal experience. And I went through a very difficult time when our family went through a very, very difficult time. Just after I came out of college uh, <laughs> and qualified as an engineer. Uh, but eventually I found a way through by reading books. So when I got that inspiration, go on radio, teach people how to succeed. The first thing I did was to say, Lord, what authority do I have to teach people how to succeed? Am I successful yet? <laughs> you know, but the Holy Spirit impressed I should do it. And I now realized why. I was underestimating how much I knew already from the books I read. So I've been teaching people how to succeed 28 years now. But honestly, in all those years, I got to find out, however fantastic your seed is, the quality of the soil will determine how it will grow. The environment is created by leaders. So I now realize, wow, it's not enough just to be speaking to the masses and telling each person on their own to succeed. Leadership matters. In fact, I discovered that at the highest level of success, you help other people to succeed. That's where my message, my success message now matured into leadership. Now, I, I studied engineering. I qualified as a civil engineer. But I now paid close attention to leadership, began to read books on leadership. Then I did my master's degree in leadership, doctoral degree in leadership. In fact, when we changed our leadership system in Desta Prison Center, because our vision is to raise role models. That's the assignment God gave us. Raise role models in the exam in the society. And I realized that's about raising leaders. I looked around. As important as this leadership issue is, why is there no leadership school? In Nigeria, no leadership school. That's why we founded Daystar Leadership Academy 2002, right? 21 years ago. And it's one of the most fulfilling things I have done in my life. We set up that school because we've seen over 45,000 people come through the school. Basically, the things you will teach in the average business school, most people cannot afford. So we do it at a very low rate. It's not for profit, but just to empower people. There's something you call the Pareto Principle. 20% of people control 80% of the wealth and opportunities in the nation. In Africa, it's not like that. It is maybe 3% or 2% controlling almost everything and leaving everybody else to share a little. So my goal has been to populate that top portion, that 20, top 20% 20 portion, so that we can raise leaders that have conscience and that have skills to lead people right. Yeah. Okay, but, uh, Pastor Sam, in line with the leadership question, you have been away from the church headquarters in Lagos since the outbreak of uh, COVID-19. But the church keeps growing in numbers. What structure did you put in place to sustain the church while you are away? Thank you very much for that question. 
in the first three years of this time, the growth was very slow and I found it very frustrating. Remember, I had been a branch pastor in Lagos before, grown the church to about 1,200 or so. So I thought, hmm, easy to, when we start this time, clear 1,000, then we grow it into a mega church. It was not growing. At the end of the first year, we were 200 plus. Second year, like 300. Ah, I became desperate. But eventually, I found a system. I, I, I was able to find what the problem was. Management, systems, leadership. Okay, Management has to do with optimum use of resources. Material resources, financial, time, you know, and people. Leadership has focuses on people and unleashing their potential. So I realized we did not have a training system. A training system that would consistently train everybody and take them from one level of skill and commitment to Christ to the other. So I'll tell you the major thing we did, end of 1998 into 1999, was that we designed a new system. The backbone of it was a training system that we call the Desta Academy. It's different from Desta Leadership Academy. Desta Leadership Academy, our objective there is to train you to start and run organizations. But in Desta Academy, our focus is on helping you to be a, a good Christian, right? A good Christian that has character, that has the character and the competence and the capacity of Jesus Christ. So we designed it at four levels. <laughs> So it's then like a higher institution, 100 level, 200, 300, 400, right? When you come in at the first level, which we call, also call membership school, you will hear everything about this stuff, how it started, what God said, how it is structured, the requirements of being a member, benefits of being a member, all that in detail. Once you understand that vision and buy into it, it's, it just powers you all through. But the training gets more sophisticated as you go on. Second level is maturity school. Third level is ministry school. Fourth level, mission school. This is basic training for all members of this time. Mm. That helped us to develop a culture, unique culture of raising people that have character. Mm. So this is it. Once we were done with the first level of training, it took me nine months to get to the first level. I was teaching one hour every Sunday before the service started. Once we finished, we just shared it. Few classes taken by pastors, most taken by members. In this that we say every member is a minister. So it is because from scratch, we stopped carrying all the load for the ministry and for the work. We shared it with church members. That's why even when we're absent, the church is able to run. Wow. Mm. So given the leadership deficit we, we actually have in Nigeria, don't you think our leaders need to come for this leadership training in your, in your, in your church? Wow, thank you. That's a very good question. It reminds me of something that happened. I was on a flight with an ex-governor some years ago. So I commended him because he did some things while he was governor that showed that he has vision. So I commended him and told him that most of his colleagues holding political positions don't have those called good leadership skills. He said, Sam, I agree with you. He said, Nigeria is like an aircraft that is being flown by pilots that did not go to flying school. And when they crash the plane, everybody will be screaming. I agree. We need leadership skills cultivation in Nigeria. We need it on a massive scale. I know you're talking about the people in leadership. Honestly, for people holding leadership positions already, we're talking about something they should have gotten yesterday. You know, let me say all of us <laughs> that are holding leadership positions because I'm in the club, we should have acquired these skills since yesterday, it's not when someone is now holding a leadership position that the person should be looking for how to acquire leadership skills, right? So, but we can do intervention. And this is what leaders do all over the world. They get coaches, they get consultants to help them specifically in the area of leadership. 
People make a lot of assumptions about leadership. First, because of our culture, our leadership culture where it is kings that we've always had in our basic culture in Africa, the understanding of most people is that you're occupying a position is what makes you a leader. These days, we are telling people, occupying a position does not automatically make you a leader. It only gives you the opportunity to lead. And a lot of people are squandering that opportunity. So for best performance, I advise people in leadership position already to get coaches, to get mentors. Even the best players in football still have coaches, right? Because once you are holding the position and everything is coming at you right, left, and center, it's difficult for you to have to maintain self-awareness. You need feedback. The other thing I would say, therefore, is this. The best time to train a leader for leadership is before the leader <laughs> occupies a leadership position. In the parts of the world that are way ahead of ours, they start from primary school. Honestly, I'll tell you what they do. It's not, they don't teach sophisticated um, theory to skill, to kids. They teach them service. They take them to orphanages. They take them, you know, to places, old people's homes, where they can volunteer, do something for free to help other people succeed. Selfishness is part of human nature. All of us are born selfish. Isn't it amazing? I was watching a, a, a video, you know, two days ago on Instagram. Different children, tiny kids, that their parents gave something to eat, and then the parents said, give me to eat, and they said, no. We're all born self selfish. In fact, somebody said that's why we like selfies, right? When you go through that kind of leadership training from primary school and secondary school, what are they doing? Beating self-centeredness out of you, changing your focus from yourself, focusing on other people. In the U.S., when you want to go from high school to university, they ask you to write a personal statement. Many young people don't know. What they are looking for are the acts of service, volunteering that you have done. In their own view, you are a dangerous person. To go and get university education and still remain a selfish person. So this is part of the challenge in Africa. We're raised in poverty, most of us, in lack, right? In, in deprivation. They don't beat selfishness out of us. We find ourselves in positions of leadership. The first thing we do by instinct is to find a way to preserve our destinies. So take as much as possible to make sure that you and your generations never get poor. So I want to therefore encourage leadership training should start from the family, then the schools at all levels. People should be made to read books on leadership, People should attend conferences, like we have one coming up uh, first week of November in Desta. We call it Excellence in Leadership Conference. When people come there, they think it is CEOs of organizations, popular, famous people that were gathering. Mm -hmm. Our own definition of leadership is everybody. Mm -hmm. Everybody has the potential to lead. So old people, young people, pack the place out, and we dig into the bolts and knots of leadership. Mm. Mm. So the, let me go back to you know the spiritual aspects of of the church. We heard of um, testimonies of miracles of great dimension in Daystar, especially miracle babies and thriving businesses. How do you manage to do this with your calm approach to teaching? Unlike other pastors that we see, they have to make it a big deal. You know they. They take big places and do crusade and all that. But you, you, you have this dramatic. calm approach. And be, most of them are so dramatic about it, but you are not. You know? <laughs> so how do you do it? Thank you. So the interesting, the real truth of it is that people are different. And the Bible makes provision for that, right? Our personalities are different. It is God that designed it like that. Some are designed to be introverts. Some are designed to be extroverts. I am an introvert. I don't, I don't like talking, <laughs> which is difficult for people to believe these days because I talk a lot. It's like I talk for a living, right? 
uh, I don't like attending social parties and so on. I don't like shouting and so on. But other people's uh, personalities are different. In fact, my, my first pastor, you know, is, is an extrovert. So when those of us that were training under him, the first thing we did, you know, when you have a mentor, everything the mentor does, you do, because yeah. to you, that's the secret of success. So all of us used to talk fast like him, gesticulate like him, and all that. I used to feel strange, because that was not natural to me. But eventually, I now found out, God designs you for your purpose. Mm. The more you try to be like somebody else, the more you will be a duplicate. And God only makes originals. So once mm. I just decided to switch and flow with my nature, then I found out that really is where my talent is. So this issue of ministry, especially, and getting results, getting impact, making impact on people's lives, healings, miracles, and so on, they are products of the work of the Holy Spirit. And they flow through your gifts. Once you're trying to function out of your area of gifting, you will be like someone who doesn't have gift for singing that is trying to sing. You won't get the results. You will be frustrated. The people you're trying to reach will also be frustrated. So my secret has been identifying my gifts, hmm. you know, identifying my unique talents. And I have turned the talents into skills. So because my talent is turned to my brain, like I said, my number one gift is teaching. That's why I have, have pushed. Oh. Pastor Sam, I do hear me. <laughs> we'll get back to him quickly. Get back to him. Oh, no, no. Just waiting to be reconnected there. You know, his personality, <clears throat> humility is something that, it's, you know, it's, so, it's so soft spoken, not, yet he makes the right impact. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, life is not by gara gara. It's not it's in true. any way yeah. dramatic. You know, it's no. not. But is a teacher. Come yes, teacher. and I'm, 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 how I'm getting taught. Oh, honestly, I'm getting <laughs> taught, and I'm all ears. I'm really enjoying uh, this uh, session without paying for it. Yes, it's like a master of course, nobody will yes. know. You Without know. paying for it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Pastor Sam, <laughs> I'm also yes. a product of your leadership academy some years back. I wasn't able to, Finish you know, you. complete my intermediate <laughs> or <laughs> my advanced wow. listening. But then, you know, that time, I remember that time you taught us about structure, taught us about, you know, putting things in, in place. What is the position of the Bible on people falling down when hands are laid on them as a sign of being filled by the Holy Spirit. Seems to be a lot of drama going on around us, and some people are not always, uh, you know, comfortable with it. Right. So, it, it, it's in First Corinthians chapter 12, Paul the Apostle describes differences in giftings, in callings, uh, in operations, in the operations of the Holy Spirit. And when you know, you know, when you're talking about the Holy Spirit, you can't box him. You can't confine him. He's God. He, can, he has one trillion and one different ways he can do something. What you don't want to do is to take something that the Holy Spirit does, maybe just in a particular instance, and turn it into a doctrine. Right? When you look at Jesus Christ and the way he healed people, you know, different different ways. Uh, some he would just talk to them. Some he would touch them. One person, he spat on the ground, made mud, and put it in his eyes. This man had never seen his whole life. But then you don't see that that's how Jesus healed every blind person. So this is what I would say. That where it is genuine, and the Holy Spirit overwhelms the person, it is possible for their physical faculties to give way, possible for them to fall down. What you don't want is a scenario where, where the ones pushing them to fall down or insisting that they must fall down. At the end of the day, if they fall down and stand up and nothing changed in their lives, what did we achieve? It just feeds our own ego. Uh, but I would not put anything, you know, ex except if it is illegal, outside of what the Holy Spirit can do. There are different ways it can touch a person's life and people have different giftings, but we are always subject to the temptation 
of going excess, going extra. That's what we, sh we should watch against. I want you to speak on the, on the role of some pastors uh, during the electioneering season. A lot of pastors made predictions that were uh, well off mark in a manner that put many Christians to shame, that questioned the faith of many people. Mm -hmm. Should pastors, should ministers be involved in politics uh, uh, to the extent that we saw during the 2023 elections? Should pastors take position, given that the shepherds, a lot of people with diverse uh, uh, tendencies mm. and the rest mm -hmm. of it. Should they take political positions? Mm. Interesting question. <laughs> <laughs> First, you read through the Bible, you see uh, people gifted to be prophets, and people would say, oh, this is what God said, and so on. And you know, the basic rule in the Bible has always been pay attention. Take note of what the person said. If it comes to pass, fine. If the person likely heard from God. If it does not come to pass, God said, then it means the person did not hear from God. And from that point onwards, uh, everyone can then decide how they are going to relate with that prophet or man or woman of God, right? Uh, it's a big risk, though, to just want to predict all the time when you have an election coming. Uh, sadly, in Bible times, the leadership style was not democratic, right? <laughs> what they had was the monarchy, so nobody was electing anyone. If not, we would have been able to draw direct inferences. So now that we're in democratic uh, uh, you know, dispensations, the question would be, so what's the purpose of the prediction? Really, what's it meant to do? What's it meant to achieve? What value is it meant to add? Is it meant to promote the person? Is it meant to prove to people that we're close to God or hear from God? Because the amazing thing is, under the new covenant, <laughs> the Holy Spirit actually lives inside the Christian. So every Christian has their direct channel to God. Uh, that's what I would ask people actually to pay attention to. Uh, you can't be a new covenant person, a Christian, and be living your life as if you are under the old covenant where you had one or two people that heard from God and came to tell us what God said. You are, you are submitting yourself to the possibility of manipulation and uh, the day you appear before God, you will answer for yourself. So, um, I can't control anybody. We have freedom of uh, thought and freedom of speech, <laughs> right? And freedom of association. Should a pastor uh, be partisan? I would advise on the pulpit, no. It, personally, it's within their rights, right? To even be card carrying members of political parties to have their political persuasions. On the pulpit, I would advise a pastor not to be partisan. That would be my advice, just for the fact that, like you said, mm. our members belong to various political parties. Yes. What I believe we should focus on more is promoting the values of Christ, because it is those values that actually shape behavior in the society. So right. at the end of the day, uh, we all should love one another. That's all. All right. In terms of the poor leadership recruitment process in the country, who should take the blame? Governments, culture, or the people? Mm. <laughs> who should take the blame? Well, Maybe I should say that I would rather not say blame, but just focus on uh, the positive aspect. Focus on building right now. We did not create the culture in which we found ourselves. We were born into it. 
And I want, just want everybody to be conscious of the fact that that culture is not going to deliver the quality of life all of us are looking for. We say we are running a democracy. We don't, our leadership culture does not have the values that drive democracy. For example, in the parts of the world where they have achieved good success or good progress with democracy, they value equality. It's in the it's in the Declaration of Independence, for example, for the United States, all men are created equal. Mm -hmm. In a monarchical system, all men are not created equal. The king cannot be equal to the citizens. The citizens are practically slaves of the king. And this is the structure that is in almost in the DNA of every African. It's in our families, it's in our businesses, it's even in our churches, it's in the government. In the democracy, we treat the people we elected as if they are kings. They're not. They are our servants. So how do we change that? So that's why I can't blame anybody for it. We were born into it. The challenge we must all accept now, we must take it, is that we need to change the culture. We need to change our leadership culture. Isn't it amazing that whether we're under democracy or monarchy or military, that it is under development and poverty that we're producing. We need to change something, right? We need to change our value system and shift the culture. The purpose of leadership is not to dominate people. It is to serve people. And that's why I speak specifically to Christians. Jesus Christ spoke to the leadership culture of his day. He said, you know that among the Gentiles, their rulers lord it over them, but among you it shall not be so. Anyone who wants to be the leader among you should be your servant. Anyone who wants to be the first should be the slave of everybody. He said the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to, and to give his life as a sacrifice for many. So today we're complaining. So you see, in the monarchical structure, the king's owner owns everybody. The market is Ojaoba, the farm is Okoba, even government is Ijaoba, the assembly of the king. Sorry, but in the democracy, it's supposed to be the government of the people by the people for the people. Uh -huh. So I'm asking that it is time for all of us now to realize the purpose of leadership is service. It is to empower people, not to empower the leader. To do that, we must start from our families, to our schools, you know, uh, to the books we read, to the conferences that we run and attend, to getting mentoring and coaching, and that starts with everybody. The people in leadership position, they must understand they have a huge responsibility. They need to model it now, just as just a model. Everybody as citizen needs to develop the quality because leadership happens at all levels. It's already we're already doing like it. To, <laughs> we, uh, pastor, we have to, pastor, we, we have to bring you back. And Baba Jiri is telling me that we have to bring, we you, have back. To bring you back. We have to bring because you back. Because we've now exhausted our questions. Our questions. <laughs> we have to bring you back. One good thing about him, he could speak on and on. And when he went um, abroad, he started this leadership session and I was following online. Virtual. And I, Virtual. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Fantastic teacher. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I want to thank yeah, you, <laughs> Pastor Sam Adeyemi. The senior Thank pastor you so of the Star Christian Center. And the journalist hang out. Thank you so much. <laughs> Julie, Thank you, you for hanging out you with see, us. You see our pastor's bar. Mm. Eh? 50 mopus. You know, he said something. Every he said, he said um, uh, leaders are supposed to be servants. Yes. But we treat our leaders not as servants, we treat them as emperors, mm -hmm. as if they own us. Very, very. You know? You see a lot of wisdom uh, nuggets. So is in, how do you yes, pronounce nuggets. it? Yes, yes, yeah. a lot. No. From, from, from this everything that I said to me. And uh, we really have to bring him back. Yes. Uh, when, to uh, to, he's to ask more questions. You know, the, come, the, first day, the, the first day I saw him, I saw him driving himself. No airs around him. No, no, no Mopo. So you see you know? them with uh, uh, Mopo. Mopo. <laughs> They'll be pushing you. You, you know, we asked, we asked the pastor. The we said, look, if it is God that protects, Yes. How come you? How come, come you have so many following so, you? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you, you Meanwhile, you come, you open Bible for us. You <laughs> didn't know what to <laughs> ask. <laughs> what the question? Thank you for your contribution. <laughs> and the message uh, himself, Papaji the Colony and Study. And that's our offering today. Join us again tomorrow for another episode of the program. You can watch the pre-broadcast tonight at 11 p.m.
Join us this Sunday from 1.30 to 3.30 p.m. The Journalist Hangout on Sunday on YouTube, youtube.com slash TVC News Nigeria. I'm IADB Isiba. See you tomorrow and God bless Nigeria. Africa's creative market is here again. Yes, the biggest gathering of African and international creative industry professionals is back. First in Lagos, November 2023, and in Dubai, March 2024. Come join thousands of creative professionals as they gather with their counterparts for trainings, workshops, masterclasses, conferences, fashion shows, networking, and a mega music concert featuring some of Nigeria's biggest acts and many